Welcome to Bible Mysteries. What if there are secrets in the Bible the world doesn't want you to know? You're listening to episode 146, Edom and Rahab, interview with Timothy Alberino. Now here are your hosts, Scott and John. Hello, welcome once again to Bible Mysteries Podcast. I'm Scott Mitchell. I'm John Potts, and this is the show that talks about things in the Bible the world doesn't want you to know. And boy, John, are we going to get into some things the world doesn't want to know today. In just a moment, I'm going to introduce our very special guest to our audience. But we're going to first acknowledge some of our new seekers, our premium subscribers. This episode is brought to you by Lene O, Piali F, Lydia G., Jeremy S. and Catherine M., all who became members back in January of this year. Now, thank you guys for subscribing. And don't forget to you have bonus content as a part of that if you do choose to do the premium subscription. But we are very honored to welcome Timothy Alberino back to Bible Mysteries Podcast. He's known as the modern day Indiana Jones. Timothy is a consummate explorer and has just recently returned from an expedition to Cusco, Peru. I hope I'm saying that right with uh, Luke and Nate from Blurry Creatures Podcast. A shout out to our friends, Luke and Nate. His inquisitive mind and insatiable appetite for adventure have led him all over the planet in search of lost cities, lost civilizations, hidden treasures, and legendary creatures. He's also an avid researcher and published author with, whose scholarly pursuits are as daring as his expeditions. The website is timothyalberino.com. The book is Birthright. The Coming Post-Human Apocalypse and the Usurpation of Adam's Dominion on Planet Earth. And the man is Timothy Alberino. Timothy, welcome home from Peru and welcome back to Bible Mysteries. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. Well, we are very excited to have you. And before we dive into our topics today, I just have to ask if there's anything new or exciting that you'd like to share that you may have discovered on this recent trip to Peru. Uh, not anything new. It was certainly exciting. Uh, I did visit for the first time. I visited a site called Nyalpa Iglesia, which is between Cusco and, well, it's near Ojantaytambo. It's, it's on the road between Cusco and Ojantaytambo. And it is a, it's, it's a site that is not heavily visited, heavily trafficked by tourists. It's off the path. You have to climb up the side of a mountain to get to it. And so that was a new experience for me. I've known about Nyalpa Iglesia for some time, but I've never visited it. And the site is, it's traditionally regarded as a portal. And it's, it's a, I believe it's a andesite. Uh, it's, a, it's a face of a, of, a, of a large stone that's fallen off the mountain, very large boulder. And it's carved. There's a, there's a, um, it's difficult to describe. There's sort of a doorway carved into it with great mm. precision and carved and polished. And then there are some other carvings at the site. And again, the the Andean tradition, according to Andean tradition, it's, it's a portal. But I don't believe that we're talking about a portal to another dimension or something like that. I literally think, and I, and this is, you asked me if there's anything new and exciting. Well, I think that we've discovered some evidence that what it is in actuality is a marker to an access point into the mountain, into the underground world called the Shinkana under the Andes, which is a the under the underworld of the Andes, but also it refers to a massive, extensive tunnel system that goes for hundreds or perhaps even thousands of miles beneath the Andes. And I think that Nyalpe Glacier might be a marker marking entry into this underworld. So that that's something new that I'd never seen. So that was uh, that was entertaining and interesting. <laughs> to say the least. I Did think I've seen portal? pictures of that very portal. Excuse me, John, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. Did you happen to get any pictures or uh, video photography of that? Uh, yeah, the guys in our, the, the, the people who were along with us on this expedition uh, it took lots and lots of pictures so um i'm sure they're, they'll be popping up on I'll, I'll post some to instagram whenever i get around to it i'm sure there's some pictures of me there yeah. that are floating around um Fantastic. and of other members of our group and lake uh, rather uh 
uh, Luke and Nate from Blurry Creatures, as you said, were were on this uh, expedition with me. So I'm sure there's pictures of all of us up there. Yeah, uh, and I'm sure they'll be releasing some information too uh, at their website. Well, um, you know, speaking of Luke and Nate, um, you and I actually met in person for the first time this year at BlurryCon in uh, right. in January, and um, you were so kind to talk to me afterwards. But when I mentioned wanting to discuss Mars and Rehab with you, you just sort of lit up real big and with a smile and indicated that's not many people wish to discuss this aspect of your book. And I, I just found that part of Birthright profoundly interesting. And I'd like you to give us a brief summary uh, for our listeners of the connection you draw between Mars and Edom. Well, this is an aspect of my book that most people don't ask me about, which I find quite intriguing because I think it is one of the most interesting things that I talk about. Yeah. I didn't invent this uh, information. I gleaned from uh, I gleaned from, first of all, the late David Flynn, his mm -hmm. book, Cydonia, The Secret Chron Chronicles of Mars. He's the one who first brought this to my attention. But then also, uh, this is some of this information is, is known in the rabbinic traditions, the, the uh -huh. Jewish rabbinic traditions, and, and it, it's all very compelling. So um, I don't wade into this territory very often because it's difficult for me to remember all of the details associated with this topic. When I say details, I mean the scriptural references, because there are many scriptural references. It's Rahab appears in the Bible in several instances, but also associated with the dragon and with Edom. Yes. And so uh, when you knit these, these various topics together, what you begin to realize is that you have a this tapestry begins to form, begins to uh, manifest, and, and it, it depicts what I believe is a galactic war, a galactic rebellion that happened a long time ago. And the, and the, the scriptures are intimating, uh, are alluding to this, to this, this, <clears throat> this galactic war of unimaginable destruction that occurred before, previous to the creation of mankind. Yeah. Now, I believe that the scriptures, the 66 books of the Bible are divinely inspired. I think that the, that we have the plain text, we have the plain reading of the text, which is the stories and the histories and the, the narrative of, the, of the, the, the various things that are going on in the Old and New Testament. We have, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the, which is the main purpose, the, the primary message of the scriptures is to deliver the gospel of Christ to mankind, both Old and New Amen. Testament. Um, and we have, uh, we have a lot of contemporary information that was relevant, for example, in the New Testament to the early church. But within all of this obvious content, I believe we also have, because it is divinely inspired, we also have coded information, information that was laced into the narratives, both Old and New Testament, especially the Old Testament, that is informing us in a very cryptic way about things that happened before we were here. Yes. And things that pertain not to mankind directly, but to other entities who preexist mankind. And that that information is hidden. It's not made plain. And of course, many people, when they hear me say things like that, their their reaction is, well, why would God hide those things from us? The answer is, I don't know, but I can tell you that he does. The psalmist tells us, or the, rather the, the writer of Proverbs, Sol Solomon tells us that it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Amen. And not, so it's not only that he does it because... Uh, because he has some particular reason, it's more than that. It's actually the glory of God to conceal a thing. Right. And it is the honor of kings to search a thing out. So uh, I think there's a lot concealed beneath the plain reading of the text. This is what would fall under the category of esotericism. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible is certainly, especially the Old Testament, an esoteric book. The very nature of prophecy is esoteric. Yes. Esoteric meaning it's not plain speak. Esoteric meaning it's metaphorical, it's, it's a symbolic, 
There's allegories. It's information that must be discerned by the wise. Again, I've gleaned this information from men who are much wiser than me. And all I can tell you is that um, the, the what I've been able to glean is r- remarkable in that, as I said earlier, it seems to depict uh, a, a, this conflict, this galactic conflict that occurred in a pre-Adamic context between um, or amongst the other sons of God and involves planets, other planets aside from planet Earth that were inhabited, probably the planets in our solar system. So when we talk about Rahab, uh, there are, again, the, the reference to Rahab in, in the scriptures on the face, the, the, the prima facie reference to Rahab would, would, would be a reference to a king or to a location on the Earth. But when you read all of the subtext around Rahab and the context in which it's being referenced, it becomes clear that we're not talking about a man or or an earthly location. We're talking about something far more profound. In short, I I believe that Rahab refers to a planet that exploded between Mars and Jupiter. Yeah, and we're going to even discuss that in a little bit more detail. But I think what you said about the scriptures being esoteric is certainly buttressed by the statement in Deuteronomy 29, 29, that the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. So I do think God is revealing what he wants in his time, whether it's coded or esoteric or not. And he's giving us the wisdom to understand it. And maybe the need to know is, is becoming more and more apparent. I'm really grateful that you brought that up. Now, uh, tying back to Edom, you indicated in your book that you also have a twin brother. And, I do. And, and you draw our attention to the fact that while Jacob and Esau were twins, they were very different in appearance and their heart towards God. And given the satanic influence of what you call the sibling contender aspect of brothers in scripture, such as Cain and Abel, or Ishmael and Isaac, you speculate about a different line of attack that the dragon used with Jacob and Esau and involving Rebecca, their mother's womb. Explain what you meant by this. Well, I find it interesting that both Sarah and Rebecca were barren. Mm. And this was this was a time in which women were having many children. Yeah. And the fact that both of these women were barren, and we're, we're not just talking about any women. We're talking about the women who are in the line of the Messiah, right. who are giving birth to the heir, to the predecessors of Jesus Christ and predecessors in regard to their genetic lineage. Jesus had to come through the line of David, according to the scriptures. And so when you talk about um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you're talking about Israel. You're talking about the royal bloodline that would give birth to the Christ, the fulfillment of the drag, what I call the dragon slayer prophecy. And so it, it, it cannot be coincidental or incidental that both Rebecca and Sarah Rosera and Rebecca are barren. And so I obviously, you know, Sarah, uh, Abraham's wife, um, because she, she couldn't have a child, she had Abraham lie with her maidservant, the Egyptian, her Egyptian hand servant, right. uh, Haggai. And that, of course, created all a lot of the, the problems that we see today in the Middle East. Um, and what you had was an illegitimate error, uh, rather, ear. You had an illegitimate error who, who was the product of that union, right. Ishmael, because God had promised Abraham a son. And of course, that son came in the form of Isaac. And when, when Sarah's barren wound was re- 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 miraculously brought to life, and she gave birth to a promised son. And of course, Abraham went and and we have the the enactment, the the uh, the prefiguration of of God giving His only Son as a sacrifice for the sin of mankind. We have that being play acted on Mount Moriah with Abraham and Isaac when Amen. Abraham goes to sacrifice Isaac. So we're talking about the most important lineage on planet Earth, the lineage of Abraham, and and. So it, th- this barrenness, I don't, when I read that these women were barren, I pause. It, it gives me pause because this is such an important lineage. And so um, 
we had twins in one well, rather not twins we had two sons of abraham we had isaac and ishmael and ishmael was can be considered an, an illegitimate son because he was born to the to the to, to the maidservant right uh, and Abraham, and it was an act of un, it was an act of disbelief, or rather, um, let's call it um, um, a lack of faith on the part. Uh, it was a lack of faith. I didn't want to use that word uh, because it seems strong, but it is <laughs> that is what it was. It was a lack of faith on the part of Abraham to succumb to his wife's desire for a child when he knew he had one promised, right. even though he was advanced in age, and of course. When, of course, uh, his wife chuckled when she, when she, I forget the exact context, when she heard that, her, that she would give, indeed give birth to a son in her old age, which she did. Yeah. Um, and of course, it is uh, Isaac who would give birth, who would, who would father Jacob. And uh, Isaac was the legitimate heir, not Ishmael. So there was this strange... There was this strange uh, sibling rivalry, almost uh, prenatal sibling rival rivalry here, where you have two siblings who one of them is a legitimate heir, and the other is to some extent a usurper. That would be Ishmael in this case. Yes. But if you go further back, you have it with Cain and Abel. Yeah. Well, Jesus came through the line, not of Cain, but of Abel. And so uh, through Seth. Yeah. And so um, so you, it's this strange thing. And by the way, so there are so many uh, sibling rivalry, in some cases, twin or city origin stories all around the world. For example, Rome. Yes. Rome was founded by Romulus and Ramus. Right. And Romulus and Ramus became adversaries and contended for the rule of Rome. And of course, Romulus prevailed. So um, it's this weird, this strange thing is happening. And so when I see, when I see, when we get to, when we get to Jacob and Esau, and we see these twins who are born, and, and these are twins, and one of them comes out looking like the red spawn of Bigfoot, <laughs> right. And the other one comes out looking like a normal human being. Something is wrong with that picture, regardless of whether or not these are fraternal or identical twins. There's something strange going on here. And yeah. so, um, and it's the same kind of a deal. We have Esau who emerges first from the womb. These are twins. Esau emerges first, so you have this this red hairy thing coming out of uh, Rebecca's womb, and and you can you can envision that as somebody something is usurping the birthright of Jacob, who's coming yeah. behind. Right, and Jacob, of course, what is he doing when he emerges from the womb? He's grabbing the heel. Yeah of Esau. Um, and so I, I take this concept and I develop it into, um, into, uh, a, let's call it, um, a prefiguration of what's going to unfold at the end of the age with the antichrist and Christ, because the antichrist mm -hmm. is a usurper, but Christ dethrones him at the end of the age and takes back the birthright of mankind, which is essentially what Jacob does. Um, you know, Jacob emerges from the womb second, holding on, grasping on to Esau's heel. Yeah. And then later on in the story, we, we find that Esau, because he came out, because he emerged first, he, the birthright of his father, uh, Isaac was going to fall to him. And so, as the story goes, um, Jacob's mother favored him and wanted the birthright to fall to him rather than to Esau. And so she she came up with this plan that she they would trick that Jacob would trick his father 
Isaac. Right. Uh, he would trick him because he was he was basically on his deathbed and his his eyes were dim and he he had cataracts or something, and and this condition would allow Jacob to 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 execute this ruse and pretend that he was Esau so that he would be the the, the blessing would be conferred to him rather than his what really amounted to his older brother Esau who emerged from the womb first. So Esau one day comes back from hunting and he's famished. And Jacob is making, I believe it was lentil soup. And Esau was so hungry that he told Jacob, he begged Jacob for some soup. And Jacob said, I'll give you some soup if you sell me your birthright. And Esau, Esau agreed to do that. Now, it's very important. That's a very important detail in this story because mm -hmm. Esau had to abdicate that birthright before Jacob could go and get the blessing from his father. That's, that's why that that's story is there. Good point. Because why did he need it? it? You know, if there was some sort of magical conference that happened by Isaac laying his hands on Jacob and just giving him a blessing, then then why did Jacob need Esau to sell him his birthright, to abdicate, willingly abdicate his birthright? That had to happen first. And that, I think, is a detail most people miss. And obviously, if you read my book, you know that that's very important as yeah. it pertains to the birthright of mankind. So Esau had to willingly abdicate his birthright to Jacob, which he did for a bowl of stew. And, and once Jacob, Esau had abdicated his birthright, then, then this ruse that Jacob was going to play on his father could be executed and effectuated. because. Esau had already abdicated his birthright to Jacob. Now all Jacob had to do was go and get the blessing, yeah. it, which is what he did. And we all know the stories. His mother, um, uh, Rebecca, wrapped, in order to mimic Esau, uh, he, she wrapped Jacob's arms in goatskins, his forearms, because she knew that her husband was going to grab his arm when he conferred the blessing. Now, now that's now that's... Really strange, wrapping his forearm forearms in goat skin. Yeah, that's one hairy dude. I mean, yeah. that, that Esau's not, Esau is not hairy like just a hairy guy. He's hairy yeah. like an animal. Yeah. yeah, and not only that, not only that, it was it was also this is another detail a lot of people miss is that she had him wear Esau's clothing. Why would she have him wear Esau's clothing if if Isaac is blind? What does it matter what he wears? Right. Well, I'll tell you why. Because Esau had a very peculiar odor. Mm. That's why. A very unusual odor. Almost so, Bigfoot-like. <laughs> exactly. So combine these two things together, this, this un, inhuman hairiness with this peculiar odor. That's what's going on here. Yeah. And so it would be, it, it, it would, this, is a, this is a good ruse then, because now Jacob goes into to Isaac to get the blessing converted to him. Of course, Isaac thinks it's Esau. Why does he think it's Esau? Because you can't mistake, you can't mistake the touch and the smell of this guy for anybody else. Right. That's why Rebecca knew it would work. He, 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 he was unmistakably uh, identifiable by his, by the, by, by his excessive hairiness and his yeah. peculiar odor. Yeah. That's not, incidental that's oh, a very I, important detail because most <laughs> the human beings this is not this is inhuman what's happening here um at least in my estimation there's something very very strange going on here well i, and I, I agree and i want to come back to deal with the legality of the birthright because you touch on it so so much in the book it's such a salient point but before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and just jump into the rabbit hole here. And uh, you can steer me out if I'm going too far afield. But do you believe it's possible that the current abduction phenomenon could be thousands of years old, possibly involved in the birth of Jacob and Esau? And, and if, if that is true, why do you suppose it continues to this day since the seed of the woman has already been defeated uh, or the seed of the woman has defeated the dragon rather at the cross? So can you rephrase that question? Yeah. So in other words, we're talking about this inhuman type of uh, characteristic of Esau. And 
is it possible that's the result of something involved in ah. alien abduction and genetic manipulation? Well, so I personally believe that, although there's no direct indication of this in the text, mm -hmm. I personally believe that somebody had implanted something in Rebecca's room along womb along with Jacob. Mm. Yeah. And we can do it today in vitro fertilization. It's not right. difficult for us today. Exactly. Um, now they weren't doing in vitro fertilization then. Um, and I don't think that there's any indication whatsoever that Rebecca had sexual relations with a Bigfoot or right. something like that. Exactly. So something else is happening here. Um, I don't believe that it was, as I said, coincidental that that you had this red. By the way, he's not just here, he's red. Yes. So um, there's something strange going on here. There's an attempt to usurp the birthright of Jacob. And why would the dragon want to usurp the birthright of Jacob? Because he wants to forestall his fate, and he wants to foil the dragon slayer prophecy, and he wants to stop the coming of this son of Adam who would who would crush his head. Exactly. And so, um, and he knew because of the promises that were spoken to the patriarchs, he knew which, which bloodline Christ was coming through. He knew. And that's why he's constantly assaulting it. That's why he's constantly after the, the lineage of David, the lineage of Abraham. And so, uh, obviously, even, even trying to stop the Israelites from from uh, from entering the promised land by laying a minefield of Nephilimic tribes yes. that they would have to fight through to take the land. It probably was the literally the most difficult place uh, to subdue on planet Earth yeah. because you had tribes of giants. You had the walls of Jericho, which were probably megalithic walls uh, that, that had to be assaulted in order to take the promised land. So God, the, the, so it's clear to me that the dragon knew a, that that the Israelites would occupy Canaan and would and would build the city of Jerusalem, and B, that the Christ would come through the line of Abraham in Jerusalem, in the city of, well, in Bethlehem, but in 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 the greater Judea area. Right. So, and this is and this is played out obviously, and uh, he didn't know exactly the circumstances, but he knew generally the circumstances because this plays out in when Jesus is born in Bethlehem and the wise men, the, the, the really what they were was they were, they were Eastern astronomers right. who came to pay homage to this eternal King who had been born. And there's reasons why they knew he had been born. They knew the general direction in which he was born because they were following a particular star, yeah. but they didn't know exactly where he was to be born. And so they went and inquired of, of Herod. By the way, Herod was an Edomite. He was. That's so right. they inquire of Herod, and Herod tells them that, according to the scriptures, he's to be born in Bethlehem. That's how they knew how to get to specifically to Bethlehem. Um, but it's clear that they didn't know that Herod didn't know exactly who Jesus of Nazareth's parents were. Because what he did next is he ordered the, the slaughter, I think, of, of all the three-year-olds and, and under, correct? Yes. The, the infanticide. Yes. To, to try and, you know, dragnet and, uh, with this slaughter and, and catch the Christ within it, catch the, 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 the promised king who was born somewhere in the region, try and catch him in this, in this infanticide. And this dragnet infanticide, he didn't know exactly where he was. He just knew that he was somewhere in Bethlehem. So that, that's just to demonstrate how the dragon has certainly been continually attempting to devour the seed of the woman. And that, of course, is also symbolized in John's vision of the red dragon and the woman. In the woman who's, giving, who's about to give birth. And what is the dragon doing? He's poised to devour her offspring. That's not one incident. That is the... That is the, the continual positioning of the dragon, was the continual positioning of the dragon until Christ was born and, 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 and you know, delivered 
from death and resurrected and taken up to heaven. And that's what happens to the man child. He's born of the woman and, and, and is immediately taken up to heaven. And of course, that man child will rule the nations with an iron scepter. That's the son of God. That's right. Jesus of Nazareth. But the dragon was always poised to devour the son, the offspring, the promised offspring of this lineage. I don't think that he knew exactly which one was going to be the Messiah. He was always positioning himself to thwart this genetic lineage somehow and and to turn the kings against god so that god would judge them and send in their enemies and wipe them out which it did happen with the babylonian exile for a period of time until cyrus and until they returned to rebuild so this is the this had this was the continual posture of the dragon and uh, so when i see jacob and esau i see this the dragon is posturing himself to devour the son, the offspring of the woman, the offspring of Eve through the line of Abraham. And in this case, it was Jacob. Yeah. And not to kill Jacob, but rather to steal his birthright. Because obviously the dragon is poised to devour, but, but God is divinely protecting and, and guiding the offspring of Abraham at the same time. So there's this tug of war happening. So... Um, anyway, I believe that, yes, something happened that was unnatural. Um, I believe that Esau was an unnatural, illegitimate son. Now, does that mean that, going all the way back to your question, does that mean that something like an alien abduction happened and, some, and, a, and, a, and an embryo was implanted next to Jacob? Or does that mean that some sort of an in vitro fertilization happened? Or something else. Um, I'm I'm definitely open to those possibilities, and in fact, as I said earlier, I lean in that direction. Although it's rank speculation, I don't have any. There's nothing I can point to in the scriptures behind besides the abnormality of Esau oh, yeah. that, that that would suggest such an event, such an occurrence. Well, I, I think it's it's a it's an interesting topic to speculate on, and I don't think it's completely. Uh, out in the left field there, but it, it just, it begs the question for me, um, if, you know, if regardless of what caused um, Esau to be implanted or whatever, um, it seems that there's an abduction phenomenon taking place now where similar type of in vitro fertilization or uh, uh, is taking place. And it makes me wonder if, if the dragon knows that he couldn't prevent the birth of the Christ and uh, and he's been defeated at Calvary. I wonder why he continues to okay, so, invade and and do what he's doing. In well, that we, we, the dragon may or may not have anything to do with the gray aliens and the okay. abduction phenomenon. Uh, I don't know, mm -hmm. but uh, I don't believe that the dragon is so is is so uh, pervasive that he, that he's got his fingers in everything that's happening. Yeah, I think his efforts are finite. And, and focused, um, the, the, the gray alien phenomenon, the abduction phenomenon, maybe something completely out of left field. Certainly he's going to use it to his advantage. I think that's yeah. given. Okay. Um, but whether or not he's actually masterminded, conducting the operation behind the scenes is, is unknown. Yeah. Um, but the abduction phenomenon is, of course, very real. And, oh, yeah. um, and babies are implanted into, or rather, uh, zygotes are implanted into wombs, which grow into fetuses, which then are extracted before the women are showing around the three-month period, before the three-month period of pregnancy. I believe that's the first trimester. And then those babies are removed in a, in a subsequent abduction, and they are the rest of their development happens in a gestation tank. And, and they're, basically, they're basically born in a tube. Um, at that point, uh, a, a tank, um, a nutrient tank of some kind. In short, I believe that the, it's my opinion that the hybridization program being perpetrated by the greys is for the purpose of planetary acquisition. In other words, the greys are introducing advanced human alien hybrids in order to acquisition the earth by stealth. Now for that, some reason. That's a fascinating thought. And I now that brings me back to, of course, your book is what we're discussing anyway. But 
and, and that is in my book. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and but in birthright, and you 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 touched on this earlier in one of the previous questions, Timothy. But you talk about this. There's a legality under which these entities are having to operate. You make such a clear and salient case that the dragon is legally limited in his operation on Earth by, among other things, the birthright contract that uh, that God gave the Earth to the children of men. And you bring up Psalm one fifteen sixteen. So, right. uh, if if that weren't the case, then the superior intellect, the superior technology, the superior power and might of the dragon and the fallen angels could have easily overwhelmed humanity Certainly. a long time ago. Would you say there's a connection between what we, what I call on this show, the satanic global elites, such as governments, deep state entities, the world economic forum, what have you having an agenda, maybe the grays are part of the agenda to uh -huh. gain control of property acquisition, as you said, to the point where they control a majority interest in planetary real estate thus being able to enter into contract with the seed of the serpent that's very that's i think that uh is plausible certainly plausible so you know the question would be how many human beings have to abdicate their birthright before it's abdicated for all of mankind it's probably yeah. something like the majority of human beings right and so um we we've seen this happen once before this happened in the genesis 6 affair Yes. Where the watchers descended and took the wives from among the daughters of men who were willing wives, by the way, and and made this transaction with with their fathers. In my estimation, these were the were, were the men in the line of Cain, that they were going to give them knowledge and technology, presumably through this knowledge, if these men would give them their daughter's hands in marriage. This was a transaction. I agree. Because, because these were interlopers into our realm. And, and we are the governors of this realm. Paul says that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So if mankind was given dominion of the earth, that's irrevocable. We can abdicate dominion, but, but it cannot be taken. It, can, it cannot be wrested by force. Indeed, the watchers, the ploy of the watchers was... was very much like perhaps what the gray aliens are doing, they created hybrid beings who were human enough to inherit and appropriate the birthright of Adam. Yes. That's why they were hybrids. So I think this is why the what, this is why the Watchers did what they did. This is why they decided to create offspring with the daughters of men, because they knew that they were they could not govern the earth. Their rule would have been illegitimate. Should they be able to produce human hybrid children who were human enough to inherit the birthright of Adam, and that's probably a genetic equation, then they could legally usurp dominion of the earth through their sons, which is precisely what they did. They, they, did, they did that very thing, and I believe that was central to their plan. That's what they were attempting to achieve the entire time that's what they that was the desired outcome now the watchers certainly could have showed up on the scene and taken whatever they wanted by force i think they didn't show up empty-handed i think they showed up with advanced technology and presumably the watchers were received as gods reverent reverenced as gods oh, yeah. they received the adulation of human beings Probably not the line of Seth because Enoch was keeping them straight, but but the rest of humanity certainly would have been worshiping the Watchers. Um, but the problem is that for them and for the Dragon is that they there, there's a police force, there's a cosmic military. It's called the Kingdom of Heaven, the armies of heaven, which show up all over the place in the Old Testament. In fact, one of the most prominent and prevalent titles for God in the Old Testament is the Lord of Armies. Lord of so what is, the purpose, what is the purpose of an army if not to defend the borders of a realm and to enforce the dominion and to, to enforce and to execute the will of the king of that realm? And so the armies of heaven exist, and, it's the, and, it, and it is they who keep the dragon in check. Otherwise... 
the earth would be a veritable prison planet. So it's the armies of the kingdom. And I don't, this for some reason doesn't register with a lot of people, but it's true. It must be true. The armies of the kingdom keep the dragon in check. But at some point in the future, we know that the dragon is going to, is going to be unchecked because the restrainer is going to lift his hand. And at that point, no one's going to stop the dragon from doing whatever he wants at that point. And that point is coming in the future. And I believe that the restrainer is Michael. And I believe that the, the restrainer, broadly speaking, are the armies of heaven. And they're not yeah. going to restrain the dragon anymore because the, he, mankind is going to collectively lose dominion of the earth. Interesting. The armies of heaven enforce our dominion. So if we abdicate our <clears throat> dominion, then what's left to enforce? Nothing. Especially if we ab abdicate our dominion while perhaps the human hybrid offspring of the dragon usurps it because he's human enough to inherit the birthright of Adam and appropriate dominion of the earth. So, so remember that the, that the, the beast we read in Revelation is permitted, permitted to rule for a short time. That word permitted is very, very important. Who permits him to rule? God permits him to rule. And there's a reason why he's permitted to rule. He's doing so legally. So just like the offspring of the watchers. Now, the consequences, the consequences for that transgression, for the, for the way, the usurpation, the way that the birthright of Adam is usurped and what, and what befalls, consequence of that usurpation, those consequences are grave. The ramifications are grave. In the old, in, in the, in, after the, it, after the Genesis 6 affair, the, the, after the watchers, the miscegenation of the watchers, let's say, the consequence was nothing less than the eradic eradication of, of almost all life, or at least all human life, and, the, and the, certainly the hybrid. Yes. The watchers were bound and, and chained in, in the abyss, in Tartarus, Peter says, and, uh, and, but not before being forced to witness the utter destruction of their be of their beloved sons and then came the flood so anyway that's uh i, I believe that uh perhaps the grays are attempting to usurp the birthright of adam perhaps perhaps not um i i do believe that they want to acquisition the earth i do believe that there's some terror terraforming going on to prepare the earth to create an environment that's much more comfortable for these non-human entities hmm. um, and uh, to blot out the sun, for example. There's a reason why they have very large eyes. They're, they're highly sensitive to sunlight. Isn't it interesting that uh, our illustrious president <laughs> uh, is announcing plans to darken the sun or something along the lines recently? Yes, it's insidious. Yeah. It's insidious. I um, mean, they're doing it in plain sight. The earth well, is cooling. Yeah, it, it is. And I think most of these people doing these things in plain sight are demon controlled anyway, if, if they're not Nephilim hybrids themselves. Or, in Lee, or or taking their orders from some non-human force. Some exactly. Some non-human uh, faction. Which we're going to talk about a little bit more about oh, that, hopefully, yeah. uh, when, when we get to um, uh, something you shared at BlurryCon. But before we do that, Tim, um, John and I actually did an episode not long ago called The Mystery of Mars. And we discussed a number of NASA photographs from the Curiosity and Perseverance rovers on the Martian surface. And to us, it appears these photos reveal the remnants of a destroyed civilization. I, I'm not a geologist, geologist or uh, an archaeologist, but to me, it looks like there's more to it than what they say. And um, as you discussed already, that in, and in your book, Birthright, that the Earth is reeling from the devastation of a galactic war. Um, do you believe it's possible there were fallen angelic bases on Mars in the past? If you will, I mean, if you'll allow me, I'd like to read to preface this this conversation we're about to have with um, with a couple of paragraphs from my book, if you'll allow me. Oh, please do. That that's what we're here to talk about is your book. So I'm, your I'm going to read. I'm going to read uh, a few paragraph so if you'll bear with me this will help because i can't remember this information off the top of my head and it, that's it all right it bears that's why you wrote it down 
Exactly. So here I'm going to read from, from a chapter called Rebellion, War, and Ruin in my book, and I'm talking about exactly what we're, we're, we're beginning to discuss here, Mars and the planets in our solar system and, and perhaps those planets having been inhabited and so forth. And, and, and above this paragraph, I conclude, I'm talking about uh, the, the, the possibility that the planets in our solar system were inhabitable at one time, either because they were located in the so-called Goldilocks zone and then blown out of that zone when Rahab exploded, or because each of these planets had its own uh, special atmosphere and molten core that would allow for greenhousing effect if they were distant, more distant from the sun than the Earth, or a, more, uh, uh, a much better shielding effect closer to the sun, such as Venus, which we now know had climates very similar to the Earth's for a long time. Mm -hmm. So, and then I say this, the desolated topography of Earth's neighboring planets, marred by the gaping craters of intense meteor meteoric bombardment, implies that some cataclysmic event rocked the solar system. The asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter is likely the debris of an obliterated planet called Rahab, one of the seven shattered vessels of Edom. The connotations of the word Rahab, fierce, insolent, proud, boaster, are the calling cards of its renegade prince. References to Ahab in the biblical text are distinctly bellicose and directly associated with the dragon's rebellion and the triumph of the king who vanquished him. Job 26, 11 through 12, the pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he stilled the sea by his understanding, he shattered Rahab. Isaiah 51, 9. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Now, I would note here that when the Bible references the arm of the Lord, that mm -hmm. is a direct reference to the Son of God, who was in his bosom and is at his right hand. So the arm of the Lord is the Son of God, Amen. the King of heaven. Now, with that understanding, I'll read this again. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. So in other words, O Son of God, awake as in the days of old the generations of long ago. Was it not you, the son of God, who cut Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? I believe that is a reference to the king of heaven who pierced the dragon in, in, in a time long before the creation of Adam. Psalm 89, 9 through 10. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain, you have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Again, here's a reference to the mighty arm, the Son of God. And then I write this. Stilling and ruling the raging sea are metaphors for quelling and subduing insurrection. The shattering of Rahab was the, was the decisive blow that pierced the dragon and brought his rebellion to an abrupt and devastating end. When Rahab exploded, its smoldering shards rained down on the planets in its vicinity, each one striking with a force many thousands of times more powerful than a nuclear bomb, igniting their atmospheres with a firestorm hot enough to liquefy solid rock and vaporize everything else. The impacts would have triggered chains of volcanic eruptions and mile-high tidal waves, melting and washing away every vestige of the rebel kingdoms so that nothing would be left to posterity. Personified as a spectator to this cataclysmic event, the earth saw and trembled as the insurgent forces of the apostate princes, the gods, were incinerated before the Lord, his garments, his garments stained crimson striding forward in the greatness of his strength. And I'll end with this final scripture here. This is Psalm 97. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries round about. His lightnings lit up the world. The earth saw and trembled. 
So the earth is the spectator here. The mountains melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. And who are we talking about? The right hand of God executing the wrath of God on Rahab and on the dragon. And then he says this later on in, his, uh, in, in, in verse 7 through 9. Listen to this now. Worship him, all you gods. So who are we talking about here? Well, this isn't being addressed to humans. That's right. Worship him, all you you gods because who was around during this battle the gods the sons of god not mankind That's right. worship him all you gods zion heard and heard this and was glad and the daughters of judah have rejoiced because of your judgments O lord for you are the lord most high over all the earth you are exalted far above all gods because Amen. there was this insurrectionary gods who rose up against him and he put them down he shattered rahab and pierced the dragon and so i think this is a clear allusion to a galactic conflict that ensued in the cosmos before the creation of adam and 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 that the the story of mankind follows the progression of this story and when you look at it like that, it makes a whole lot of sense that Adam shows up on the scene and everything that ensues. It makes the human species now fits into the timeline of this narrative in a very elegant way. And so, um, although I do believe, and I said perhaps over-exaggerated the point here in the book, that the, the shattering of Rahab would have devastated the planets in our solar system. And remember, the Earth is observing, it's witnessing the destruction of the solar system in these scriptures. Um, it is possible that parts of planets or, uh, or certain planets were not as entirely uh, uh, were not as entirely decimated as others. So I believe that right now, and we know this, I think our government is fully aware of this, that there are ancient ruins on Mars. And those ruins are not from a human species. Those ruins are from a species that pre-existed us. And certainly, I believe Mars was governed by the sons of God, probably specifically the dragon himself, before he rebelled. That that governance was given to him. And that he governed perhaps even all of the planets in our solar system before this cosmic war. And perhaps... Perhaps confining this to our solar system is not is is um, is re reducing this conflict to our solar system is perhaps not really appropriate. Maybe it was much much larger. Maybe maybe th th this involved much of the expanse of our universe. Who knows? We can't know. But we but can we see the evidence in our own solar system. Let's call That's it our own neighborhood. You know? That's right. Yeah, we can at least observe that the cataclysmic results of something that occurred in our own solar system. So I do believe that there are pyramids on Mars. I think there's a lot of constructions, ruined constructions on Mars that, that uh, we have, that the ancients have to some extent attempted to copy on earth. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. In fact, uh, you, you even point out also in your book that the traditional names related to Mars, the red planet, the god of war, Ares, etc. They all show parallels to Red Esau, that Edom itself may be a, a metaphorical description of Mars and the connection Edom, that Edom, the dragon has. Edom means red. So uh, I'll read this. The name Israel means Yahweh contends. The name Edom means red. An iconographic portrait of the adversary with whom Yahweh contends is presented to the Apostle John in the form of a red dragon. Yeah. When the names and concepts they represent are combined, Israel and Edom convey the cosmic conflict in which mankind is inescapably embroiled. Yahweh contends with the red dragon. So um, I go on to talk about Edom here. Um, which is kind of complex, but uh, Edom means red. Yeah. And Edom was the primary adversary of Israel. Edom was the thorn in Israel's side. Again, Herod was an Edomite. 
And why is I don't that think many a, saints understand that, that he was not of true Jewish lineage. And, 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 and th this is so consequential. Why is it? Because, because uh, I'm trying to rem remember exactly who appointed him. I believe it was, uh, oh, his name escapes me, one of the greatest Roman emperors. It was the Romans. It was the Roman emperor who appointed Herod as the king over Judea. He was the king. So he went and he appointed knowingly an Edomite to rule over the sons of Jacob. That was a pre-planned offense. That was a great offense to the sons of Jacob, that an Edomite would rule over them. Herod was not an Israelite. He was an Edomite. And it was this Edomite who, uh, who both tried to kill Jesus when he was a baby and then played part a part in the crucifixion of Christ. So it was, uh, it's very consequential that, that Herod was an Edomite and that he was appointed by I, I, the emperors on the tip of my tongue. Let's just say a Roman emperor. It, it was a Caesar. We know we just don't, was it Augustus? Maybe no, okay. it wasn't Augustus. Um, that's uh, maybe okay. it was Augustus. You know what? Maybe it was Augustus. It, it might have been Augustus. Is it, it might have uh, been Hyrcanus? Hyrcanus? I don't know. Is that what you said, John? I couldn't hear you. Yeah, it starts with an H, H Y. Hyrcanus. Does that sound familiar? I'm not sure. Um, no. You know, you bring up a good point, and Timothy, you may know this, and I, I seem to recall, and I don't remember if I read this right, but. If I'm not mistaken, Judas Iscariot, his name is literally Ish Kiriath, man of Kiriath. Was not Kiriath part of Edom too? Uh, I'm he? not sure. That, okay. that definitely sounds. Uh... It, it ties back into this whole narrative of the struggle between the brothers, between uh, the, the 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 near. What was it? The close friend you talked about the the betrayal of the kiss mm -hmm. and uh, of Judas and the betrayal of the Son of Man with a kiss, and he. He wasn't just talking about Judas, as you point out. He was talking about a long-standing relationship that Christ had with the uh, the uh, anointed cherub, who uh, rebelled. If I'm mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly, um, but yeah, thanks, John. I can't remember. Uh, we're we're both struggling to recall. Yeah, I, was, I was, it was trying to Augustus. help out there because it, yeah. it was Augustus. It was Augustus. Okay. Coming yeah. from this conversation, just hearing this is blowing my mind. But I want to <laughs> ask Timothy real quick: what, Where do you see Genesis one two coming into all this? Does this tie in? I mean, because Genesis one two okay. says the earth was without form, right? So, if, if d does well, that tie into the destruction of that yes. that you're talking about? That is a great point, uh, John. I'm so glad you brought that up. Mm. I'm just sitting here, here wondering if, if that was pre this battle or post this battle but if it, it was, was post okay, it was so, post this battle then all of those civilizations that we now see for example under the water would not be there in theory any longer right because if the earth was without form that means it was completely destroyed at one point and and god reformed it is my thought there but Right. So I'll answer that question with reading another paragraph from my book. This is the hardest. These are the hardest questions because they require <laughs> precise answers Good. based on particular scriptures and renderings of scriptures, which my mind does not have a great aptitude to remember those kinds of things. So I say this in the same chapter, the book of Genesis begins with a planet engulfed in water and darkness, a dreadful scene that resonates with divine retribution. Many eminent theologians throughout the centuries were convinced that the inaugural verses of the biblical narrative describe the earth in a state of utter desolation, post-judgment. And then I talk about, you know, not least among them, George H. Pember, who wrote in the 18th century, who was a theologian, was a proponent of what, what sometimes people call today the gap theory. In other words, that Genesis 1, that God created in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a period there. Mm -hmm. And then the rendering, and I don't think we have time to go through all the, how we, how Pember and, and how others have derived this rendering. But um, the the rendering of Genesis 1, uh, I'm trying to find the original here because I kind of only remember the, the, um, 
the alternative rendering. Um, what is the 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 Masoretic the, rendering of Genesis one two? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and, and the, the earth, earth was without form and was void. without form and void, and darkness was upon the upon face, the face of the, of the earth. deep. And the Spirit of God but, moved upon the face of the waters. But there is, re let's just say this, and I and I detail it in my book. I do. Mm -hmm. I, I go. I detail it exhaustively in my book. How we get to this rendering. There is re good reason to believe that the rendering is more that this verse is more accu accurately rendered thusly. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, but the earth became okay. desolate yeah. and empty, tohu vabohu, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That's a completely different rendering. And I say after this, after I give this rendering, and again, I explain why, how I get to this rendering. That's a 20-minute conversation. Right. I say this. Our story now begins with a planet wrecked in the aftermath of cataclysmic judgment. So the, the difference here is one rendering, the Masoretic rendering, the one that most people are familiar with, seems to be a continuity, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. So this seems to be the, 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 uh, the initial creation, the initial activity of creating the earth. But this rendering that I just read is a different thing altogether. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, period. But the earth became desolate and empty. That's a totally different thing. It, and, it really is. And if I may add, Timothy, I think um, uh, while I completely agree with you about that rendering is the more accurate understanding, I think the Masoretic text actually does lend itself to the same understanding, even though the word is was, which can also be translated as became. But more importantly, the Hebrew tohu vabuhu is only used three times in the Masoretic text. That's and right. the other two times are clearly in, in judgment. connection to divine judgment. judgment. So there's yeah. no reason to assume the first one wouldn't also be. Right. And in the mass and in the uh the Septuagint uses the but rendition. In other words, but mm -hmm. the earth yeah. became in whatever follows there. Right. And so that's very significant. So I agree. I, I do believe that what we have in, in Genesis 1 2 is we have two separate statements that in the very, very beginning, mm -hmm. God, through his son, Jesus, through his son, created the heavens and the earth. Amen. Period. Full stop. That's what that's happened right. in the beginning. That's why I call Jesus. The singularity, the Son of God is the initial singularity. He is the Big Bang. There was a Big Bang. His name is Jesus. Yes. <laughs> so that that's the first event. That's the initial singularity. Period. Now, what happened after that? Who knows? Mm -hmm. At some point between that and the creation of mankind came the hosts of heaven and, and this. Because, you see... It's not just angels. It's not just, oh, then he created on day whatever he created angels or whatever. No, no, no. It's not just angels. It's civilization. Yes. It's a civilization that's already in place. Is it not? It's, it's a civilization. It's in place. A, a cosmic, a, the kingdom of heaven. It's yeah. already there. Mm -hmm. And that was that just poofed into existence or was that developed over time? So, so the angels have their own origin. They have their own Genesis story somewhere that we don't know about. That's true. We, we will probably someday, but we don't know what it is now. Their origin, there's no reason to associate their origin with ours. So, Well, you're right, because he did say he created in the beginning heaven, then the earth. We know the earth was second because the angels literally sang and shouted for joy that's in right. Job 38, right? That's so, exactly right. That's exactly on, right. I, I interrupted you. Continue. No, that's, that's a great point, that the sons of God shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid. So, so, this is, uh, so what we have is the earth was, was made desolate in this event that devastated the solar system. And God decides to create a new member of the family. Yeah. Now, this makes sense. Why would God create a new member of the family? Why would he do that? Does anyone ever ask why he would do that? He already had sons. There were already sons. Why is he creating a new member in the family? Because that's what he does. Adam was the son of God. 
yeah. according to the genealogy of Jesus of Nazareth. So he's not just creating a human being. He's creating a son, a member of his family. That's right. So why is he doing this? No one ever asks why is he doing this. But it makes a whole lot of sense if this is in the aftermath of rebellion of the other yeah. sons. He's going to create a new member of the family who is unsullied by the events of the past. And, and this new member is going to be a younger sibling, and they're going to be given governance of the one realm that's restored in the solar system. He's not giving it to the other sons. And you know what he says? And I wish I could flip to the, uh, the references here. Um, I probably can't do it in time. But, but there's a couple of very intriguing, intriguing references that... I never really hear anybody talk about it except for the late Michael Heiser. I've seen them in, in his books, and I've heard him discuss them, and I'm not going to be able to flip to it in time. Uh, a there's a reference, and I'm going to botch it, but we're, that he does not, he puts no trust in his holy ones. Yeah, he, he, he accuses them with folly. Yes. Yes. So what's that about? I mean, I think that is directly associated to what happened. Here it is. Huh. Uh this is how I this is how I portray this in my book. I don't think I've ever heard anybody ask that question. That yeah, kind of, why? Why make yeah, me? It's a little mind blowing. If, if I may share a humorous anecdote, sure. a dear sister in Christ once suggested, that, you know, if the anointed cherub was every precious stone was his covering, and on and on, the sum of wisdom and perfect in beauty, and he rebelled against God. God, in a sense, said, "Look, I can do better with dirt than I did with you." That's so, a, yeah, yeah. that's that's very good. Right. Sorry, main man. Anyway, right. go ahead. This, this is a so so. Here we are in the scene after the, who knows how long after the rebellion, is put down and God, God and the King and His council. Well, you know, when we say God, we're not being exactly accurate. We should say the Son of God. Really, yes. the Son of God convenes with His council, mm -hmm. and they're making they're going to deter they're determining to create a new kind of being who would be. A son in the family. And so this is how I write this. The king's council was convened. The mightiest of the morning stars, princes and potentates all, took their places around his throne. To whom would the deed of earth's dominion be given? So this is the earth after it's renewed. The right of Job describes the, or, or previous to its renewal, when the decision to renew it is made. The right of Job describes the king's disposition. Behold, God puts no trust in his holy ones, and the heavens are not pure in his sight. Yes. What a strange thing to say. Mm -hmm. Even in his servants, he puts no trust, and his angels he charges with error. And so then I write this. Who among the host of heaven could be trusted to rule and not rebel? The council deliberated. What they needed was a servant whose heart and mind was uncontaminated by the affairs of the past. Indeed, more than a servant, a sibling in the royal family invested with the authority of a son. The resolution came forth. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And then I go on to talk about how this declaration is not some introvertive conversation between the Trinity. It is the king and his council. It is the king and his sons who are deliberating and who decide, let us make man in our image. We're going to make him in the family. Why in the family? Because he's going to govern and the sons of God govern. This is the royal household. And also I would add that not everything in the universe, not all sentient beings are sons. And that's what is very special about mankind. It's not necessarily that we are more remarkable biologically. Rather, it's what we were created to be. We were created to be sons in the family of God. And that's very important because it gives us, it imbues us with authority. The very fact that we were created to be sons imbues us with authority from the king himself, from uh, in the family of God. And so uh, it makes sense then that in the wake of such a devastating rebellion in which the hosts of heaven, a portion of them, 
rebelled against the king. And that's why I go on to talk about, I think a lot of people miss this as well. That's when I go on to, why I go on later to talk about Judas Iscariot. He is, he is the earthly um, betrayer of Jesus, but there was a betrayer before Judas. We don't know what his name was, but the Bible calls him the dragon. He was obviously very intimate with the Son of God, and intimate in, in, in the sense of friendship. And, uh, and that's why Jesus said even, uh, what is the uh, quote, uh, I don't remember, um, he says that, he who has broken bread with me has lifted up his seal against me, something like that. It's yes. a quote from the Psalms. And right. Jesus is saying that in regard to Judas, but I believe that really what the intimation is that this is about the dragon. Yeah. The dragon was mm -hmm. a son of the highest order, a confidant of the king, and then he betrayed him. That's what happened first. And so when you put the story in context, it makes a whole lot more sense. Oh, it really does. It, it's, it's, almost, it's almost amazing that we missed it for so long when, when the, the clues have been there all along. And we we tend we tend to have a very anthropocentric, as you'll point out, uh, point of view, rather than a Christocentric point of view. Um, but I think everything about Satan's deception towards the reality of the history, his history in the past, is is geared to turn our eyes away from the spiritual realm, and to get us focused on the physical and the carnal. Um, even to the point where, like, I, I learned recently that NASA actually alters all the photos from these rovers and Mars. It tends to everything red. And when you see the photos unfiltered, the rocks and the ruin aren't red. They're black or charcoal colored, surrounded by red soil, which gives far more evidence to me that more is going on than just a bunch yes. of rocks. <laughs> you know? That's right. And, they've, so, and I think that some photos have inadvertently slipped through the cracks that reveal some very interesting artifacts on Mars. And, you know, there's a large portion of Christians out there um, who contend that we've ever gone to Mars, that we've ever even gone to the moon, let alone yeah. to Mars. But I would, I would argue that we've, we don't just have rovers on Mars, Mars at this point, we've got bases on Mars and that's okay. a different and the far side of the moon as well, probably. And just just connect that statement to the recent revelations from David Grush, that whistleblower from the intelligence community, who said we've have been there have been programs under the auspices of our military that have been reverse engineering alien technology for decades. For decades. What are we wow. doing with that technology? Yeah. We're not blowing stuff up in Iraq. We got bases on Mars, and. Yeah. And I'm 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 thoroughly convinced. So we know uh, a lot more about Mars. NASA's a dog and pony show. Yeah, that's why it never. That's why NASA would never went back to the moon because of yeah. what we discovered there. When when we went to the moon, what those astronauts discovered that the moon became the purview of the military, wow. not NASA. So uh, specifically the Air Force. So or a new or a new a new organization that was probably formulated after the revelations that came through the moon landing. And those revelations are someone else is already here, A, presently, and someone was here a long time ago. Right. And, and by the way, I know we're, we're really running out of time, and you've been so gracious to give us as much of your time as you have. But I want to close with uh, uh, something that you shared at the end of BlurryCon, uh, you made a statement, and I can't quote it, but you had trusted sources that you knew that could confirm the existence of the deep underground military bases, a covenant that was made between the Greys and the U.S. government, maybe Eisenhower was involved, uh, to permit this abduction phenomenon of humans uh, in exchange for advanced technology, very similar to what you believe, and I agree with you, the exchange that took place in Genesis 6. It, it, would you refresh us or can we leave uh, with the thought of what you shared about that or do you recall it? I have, yes, I, I would, I would call them friends. I have friends who, who, whose family members have been involved in 
in some of these projects. One particular individual, if I said his name, you guys would certainly know who he is. Okay. Um, so I think there's plenty of evidence at this point that the deep underground military bases exist. I think it's really a given at this point. Um, and that these, uh, that these black projects exist. I will say this, that, and this is maybe what I was referencing was, um, I know some of the best ufologists alive today. Um, and these are highly competent people. There's a lot of ufo the ufologists simply means people who study UFOs, but in an academic way, in an investigative academic way, not casually. And I've discussed the Eisenhower event with them. And I was expecting them when I asked them if they thought that this had actually occurred, I was expecting them to roll their eyes or to give me reasons why they know it didn't. <laughs> Several of these individuals told me with great conviction that they're absolutely convinced that the Eisenhower affair happened. <laughs> the Eisenhower meeting with the an extraterrestrial faction, uh, the Greys specifically. And th I was taken aback because I had always suspected that it was true, but um, to, to realize, to, to discover that these ufologists who I have great regard for, who I believe are some of the, the, the most uh, academic and, and competent researchers in ufology today that they absolutely believe this happened that was in a way for me a confirmation although it's not a, it's, it's, just, it's not a direct confirmation of the event but it is uh, it confirmed my own suspicions and, and my own investigations into the matter so i am quite thoroughly convinced and also eisenhower's granddaughter for whatever that's worth yeah to this day swears that this happened that this is part of their family lore and uh, not in common knowledge in their family that that this meeting did happen, and that there was a transaction, and and, and it was uh, sometimes it's referred to as the Grieta Treaty. It's got other names, and it wasn't and, just a dentist appointment at San Clemente. It was not. A, yeah, he was, <laughs> in, he was at Palm Springs at the time, and Palm Springs, you know, it's Palm Springs, California. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, and so he was rushed away to the dentist. That's what the story. That's how the story goes. But rather. In reality, he was most likely taken to this Air Force base mm. and uh, and there met with a delegation of gray aliens. It wasn't like some sort of a political, you know, like a delegation of of politicians from Germany or something like that. It was probably much more bizarre. Yeah. And frightening, terrifying. I can imagine. And, and, and mysterious and... and uh, <laughs> It, it was so. Don't think of it as some sort of a rolling out the red carpet for for foreign dignitaries. Exactly. Well, did did he not leave the office saying, "Beware the military industrial complex"? Probably the only coded and safe way he could say anything. Right. Uh, in light because of the circumstances. Good, right, because that's where the technology was going. Yeah. That exchange of technology for the for the permission to abduct our citizens. Yeah, and then why would it? Why would no no ufolo, no secular ufologist can answer the question? Let's assume for a moment that the Eisenhower story is one hundred percent true. Why in the world would 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 these advanced alien beings with this technology that's hundreds, if not thousands, of years ahead of ours? Why would they need our permission? Exactly. It doesn't make any sense, and they can't answer the question. I can answer the question because they have to make a legal transaction, or they're going to get their butts kicked. Exactly, all right, back to guys with all back to technology. Birthright. Yep. And folks, if that hasn't whetted your appetite <laughs> to to read Timothy's book, I I don't know what else I could say. You're going to need to go eat some Cajun food or something spicy to to light a fire in your belly. Because this book is fascinating. I keep reading it. I reread it. And every time I do, I discover more fascinating thoughts. Um, I'll put the link where you can order the book, but timothyalberino.com. All those links will be there. Timothy, as always, it is a delight to have you. We are honored to have you take spend some time with us. Thank you so much for being here today. And I so look forward to the next thing 
you have planned. John, and anything you want to say in closing? No, I, I can tell you this. I didn't have a whole lot to say, but I was learning a lot. I was just <laughs> taking, this is way out of my league, but this is some great information, Timothy. Thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. It's always a pleasure. Well, thank you all for listening today. And once again, we thank you for being a part of Bible Mysteries. So don't forget to look up because our redemption draws nigh.